for, I mean, you've had access to some of the most important voices in our space all day here. I think at best what I can offer is just some summation remarks and maybe a, a little bit of a memory jogger as to what we talked about, why this is important and why this dialogue will be ongoing, right? So in terms of, uh, you know, when I normally give this presentation, there's a lot of skepticism sometimes as to why should we even care or why is Next Generation 911 important. That's all, you've heard about these all day, whether it's changing consumer expectations, radical changes in the devices we carry around every day. I have some stats on one of the slides that I think are, are, are impressive in terms of what we've done and where we've come from. Um, aging impact, uh, PCAP infrastructure, we've beat that one somewhat to death all day long. The IP technology revolution, Henning covered that rather well in his, uh, uh, keynote, there shouldn't be anybody now, if anybody's been at any of these conferences, who doesn't realize that what our industry is trying to respond to is the same technology transformation that's made a huge difference in all the other sectors. Um, this IP everything revolution has hit every other sector with like a tsunami except for ours. We're still stuck in an environment with 40 to 60 year old technology and 40 to 60 year old uh, funding mechanisms. That's going to have to change if we're going to serve our public correctly. Um, finally, um, the fiscal environment, the, these state and local governments never have enough money to do what they need to do. So finding efficiencies through technology are absolutely essential. And if you've been listening at all today, you've heard that and you understand that. Um, if we, let's see here, if I can, I'm going to have to go here. So, yes, certainly, please. Right. right, yeah, and that goes to points the panel was trying to make about the fact that you can't talk about technology challenge in isolation from funding, operations, and all the other pieces. It has to be considered as part of a whole. I, I, I'll give you just one example of the humor me. Uh, Minnesota. had the police stop a car, uh, uh, passenger and uh, driver, the passenger knew that her boyfriend had a concealed weapon uh, and uh, th they were African Americans when their girlfriend just knew that this isn't gonna go well for my boyfriend uh, with the concealed weapon. She got increasingly nervous. She felt that she needed to memorialize the event uh, and uh, uh, she called 911 to reduce the risk that the bad outcome would happen? No, she didn't. She uh, live streamed to Facebook because she didn't see 911 as an effective reduction tool. Right. Had we been fully next generation 911, that alternative to both memorialize the event but also engage a PSAP operator, an emergency response operator, to help uh, contribute to the reduction of risk that that event would go bad probably would have saved a life. Yeah. And the money that that community had to pay uh, uh, around the aftermath of that uh, uh, horrific uh, treatment of that one event 
I would argue that, that would have more than paid for implementation of the XN 911 in the right. community. Right. Well, and that just speaks to the whole idea of, of not siloing things unnecessarily. Because the technology enables a level of integration and synergy that we've not seen before, it doesn't make much sense to think about funding or economic models or cost-benefit justifications in those same stovepipes, I, I would agree. So, um, Earlier on the panel, I had talked a little bit about the shifting sands of technological innovation. I think it's worthwhile. You can read this when you get the slides. But it's important to note, right, that technology innovation, at least in my estimation, of what's happened during the post-war economic boom in the Western world has gone through some rather dramatic um, shifts in some very definite phases. Um, right after the war, everything was driven really by central governments, at least here the federal government. A lot of it was centered around aerospace and other large engineering projects. That shifted most decidedly in the late 70s, early 1980s towards more of an enterprise approach. The latest technological developments, things that were changing the way we live our lives were coming out of spend that uh, enterprises were doing the move off of mainframes, the move to client server, all those things that some of us in the room at least certainly lived through. And then what we've seen, and I've used the demarcation point of 2007, most people realize it's the year Apple released the iPhone. I mean, you've really seen a shift now to the consumerization of technology innovation, right? In order to be effective at doing our job going forward, this is a technology development trend that we have to be aware of and that we have to be responsive to. The problem is, is that the pace of innovation from this type of uh, technology technology change is so much quicker and is so much less predictable than what's happened in the past that if we don't take a different approach and we don't take advantage of technological innovation where we find it rather than in the ways we are used to consuming it, we'll find ourselves uh, continually behind the power curve. So I think, let's see here. All right, so yeah, just in terms of stat, right? I mean, this is the one slide I wanted to mention. If you look down at the bottom, I certainly am old enough to remember the Apollo moon landings, just barely. There's some of us in the room probably remember more, and there's probably several of you who weren't even alive at that time. But if you just look at the number, right? If you look at the CPU that drives, and this is the old iPhone 6 even, it's not even the latest one, right? So the clock speed on that device is 32,600 times faster than that of the computers that helped launch Apollo to the moon. And if you look at the um, instruction, the, the um, you know, instructions per second, um, that device executes at 120 million times faster than those devices did. Some of the greatest technological achievements of the 20th century were done with uh, a few wizards in a mainframe room and largely a slide rule. The SR-71 Blackbird, which is still the epitome of aerospace design, was largely designed by slide rule and pieces of paper. So, I mean, the, where we're at right now in terms of what we carry around and the capabilities on our belts with, uh, or in our pockets or our purses with these devices, so far exceeds where we were when the original 911 system was designed. If nothing else, maybe those are some numbers that help you under, understand the disparity between what we designed to in the late 60s when we started putting these systems in place and what people are capable of doing today. So here on this one, again, you guys can read this. A lot of this is what we've just gone through. The important thing is that, as it says down at the bottom, technology innovation has become too rapid and decentralized, right, for the public sector to use traditional governance and acquisition and procurement methodologies, operational processes and procedures, all of that, right? This goes to some of the comments the panel made, some of the ones that Admiral Simpson just offered up. Uh, technology doesn't exist in a vacuum. One can't think of technical challenges without immediately thinking about finance and operations. You have to take a holistic approach to this. And I really believe what it says at the bottom is that innovative models based on public private partnership and workload sharing, there's no guarantee that just because 911 has always been done by public employees, for an example, sitting in a PSAP, physical building in a particular room in a particular part of a county is the way this always has to be done. Should the resources probably always be local and know the environments for which they're dispatching? Yes. Should that always be the same building? Should they wear the same badge? Should they always be getting the same paycheck that they've been getting from their local city or county? I would submit no, not if we want to stay with this and keep up with what's going on. I think you're going to see the technology drive business and operational challenges that are just as radical as the technology change itself. In terms of emerging trends and things that people need to be aware of, again, this is beating a dead horse. We've talked about it all day, but like I say, perhaps the slides will be a nice summation for people when they go back to their offices. I certainly, if I don't take notes, appreciate having a slide deck that can kind of sum up what we talked about during the day. Whether it's packet versus circuit switch networks, that transition, whether it's open standards versus closed networks, 
uh, the uh, disintermediation of communications technology, right? The systems we've gotten from phone companies for 40 to 50 years have been vertically integrated. The same switch that drives the physical signals down the wire also does the business logic for moving uh, signals from point A to point B. Today, that's no longer the case. Um, we spent a lot of time on the panel talking about reliability and resiliency and how it's important to bake that in at the design phase and not to try to do it after the fact. Changes in call routing, changes in multimedia. You heard uh, Reinhardt and Jay as an example gave some great presentations earlier this afternoon on how solutions they're familiar with enable you to bring some of the data in today even before all the traditional next-gen 911 systems are um, rolled out, right? Why do we do this? I mean, you can, again, you can read the slides as well as I can read them, but whether it's to accelerate the migration process, provide more flexibility, um, allow new capabilities to be introduced quickly as the technology and innovation engine rolls along and introduces them. Without some of these changes, of course, the all-important cybersecurity piece, I mean, it is very important, right? Uh, when we talked about cybersecurity on the panel as a challenge, and, you know, I've applauded always, you know, both uh, the FCC in general and Admiral Simpson in particular has always emphasized the importance of cybersecurity. It's also important for us, I think, as an industry to realize that it's not just us that has that issue. It's hugely important to every sector, right? And this IP transformation of our technology infrastructure that supports our new uh, lightning speed business processes in all sectors, without adequate cybersecurity, all we're doing is making things worse, not making them better. So if it isn't the most important topic, it's certainly one of the top two or three that has to be addressed as we go forward. It's important to realize that this shift, right, and this, this is something, you know, that, that's from the Motorola slide decks that, that we use, but I think it's valuable here. It's not plugging any particular technology. There's definitely this shift in our business away from mission-critical communications or just mission-critical communications that was based on traditional voice um, technology and voice communications, um, traditional command and control processes and procedures, a very hardware-centric approach to public safety solutions, to this connected everything world, right? It, uh, we're, we're already at a point where more devices than uh, people are on the Internet, and that's only going to change. Um, the ability to look at context as well as uh, traditional situational awareness. Again, we've talked several times today about the importance of virtual resources, VMs, public clouds, uh, hybrid clouds. Um, we need to move from an era where public safety is simply about communications that don't fail, but about intelligence that's available that either helps us do our job better, better protect our publics, or sometimes get overlooked, better protect our first responders, especially in the era that we live in today. Um, it's as dangerous for them as it is for the public in some ways. And systems that can help us prevent any undue injury to them are just as valuable as ones that allow us to serve the public better. Believe me, I am getting fairly close here. Um, tech trends driving NG911, again, these are things we've talked about all day, but it's important to realize that there is this radical shift going on. Um, everything, the GIS-based routing, we didn't talk a lot about that today, but uh, we are moving to a regime where instead of using telephone number, and I think uh, Mark and Tim Kenyon's presentation talked very eloquently about that, the system was predicated on what's known as geographic relevance of a telephone number. That's been gone since the mid-90s in the introduction of wireless telephony, but we still have to shoehorn every new capability that we come up with in 911 or even some of the global systems. This is important to keep in mind this is a global problem as well, into a system that still uses t geographic relevancy of telephone numbers as if it was a sacrosanct principle. It's long gone and it's it's high time that we move away from that and thankfully, of course, albeit dependent upon really good GIS data and the understanding of those in charge of that data is keeping it up, keeping it formatted correctly and keeping it regularly updated, we should be able to move into an era when that telephone number, like Mark said earlier this afternoon, is the least important piece of information that a 911 center receives rather than the, uh, uh, the most important like it is today. We talked a little bit, it, it was tantalizing, and the reason why I thought maybe we might want to keep the panel up, but this will, I think, give Carol an idea perhaps for next year's conference, and maybe we can in, in see how far things have gone. But the, and Admiral Simpson and others talked about it as well, this um, move towards cloud, right? And I, without airing all the dirty laundry of TFOPA, I've had the, the pleasure 
of serving on work group two for the better part, well, as ever since the organization was chartered, and to get some of the pieces that are in the final report, or the, the, the first report that we issued, which was issued in January, and I would strongly encourage everybody in the room who hasn't read it to read it, um, there was a lot of fireworks and some resistance from people who do have legacy mentality to include some of the cloud-based pieces that are in that document, right? So there is a lot of resistance. I think none of it coming from malice of forethought. It's just our industry is filled with dedicated professionals who believe that the system, and again, I think Admiral Simpson talked about this in his keynote, it just can't go down. The way that traditional technology innovation is done today, you throw something out there, you innovate, it fails, you pivot, and you try again, doesn't work in our sector. So there's some, some wonderful skepticism that's called for, but again, things that advance so much in some of these areas, whether it's cloud-based, things like uh, software as a service, platform as a service, whether it's uh, things that are going on in the cybersecurity space. We talked a lot today about software-defined networking. We really didn't even get to touch on big data um, and analytics, and as important as those are, we certainly, through Henning's keynote and others, talked a lot about IoT. But with all these things coming down the pipe, not least of which is that first bullet on here, let me just take a few minutes to say that one of the things, perhaps, that didn't get the emphasis that it needed, and maybe that will change in uh, a future edition of the conference, and certainly at other conferences that are taking place globally, is that it's important that not only we're talking about the demise of the telephone number, we're talking about the demise of the call, right? It would be nice to come to one of these conferences in the next 18 to 24 months and not hear the word call used ever again, right? Because it's a session. It's an IP, it, it, just like Henning said, there's no more distance-based charges for IP connections. This isn't about a call anymore. It's it, it, sure it's about real-time communications in keeping with the theme of our conference, and it could be voice real-time communications, it could be video, but we're really talking about a generation of people, digital natives, call them what you want, certainly the age of my children, where people don't make phone calls in their life. The concept of a phone call is foreign to them. Anybody that's got teenagers knows what I'm talking about. What we need to be able to do is design a system that enables people to contact emergency services in real time in the environments that they're used to living in, whether that happens to be Facebook, which is increasingly not the case because it's not cool because moms use it, but things like WhatsApp or um, Twitter, Snapchat, whatever the next app is going to be, and you know the kids will find it and they'll know it. I've been in this business 32 years and my kids know apps that I've never even seen before. So they will certainly see that and it, it will happen. If we don't design the system to allow access out of those apps environments, we will miss the full promise of next gen. Yes, Admiral. And, and we're really talking multiple sessions simultaneously, yep. right? Because potentially. Because you know, lives, uh, uh, as we go forward, we've got uh, uh, collaborative sessions that we're carrying on at the same time over Facebook while you're uh, texting your yep. kids, while you're engaging in one of those old things called a call, which I'm not going to ask my wife if she's ready for a session. Right. <laughs> uh, well, there's some of us that yeah may never be able to make the transition, but I, if we come back and some of us are around 20 years from now, I those, think. But those are in parallel yes. uh, session activities that just are defined by right. the, who's on the other end of the session. Correct. Or what's on the other end of the session. Right. I mean, there certainly are people in this room I know who have been in this IP communications world for years. You know as well as I do, right, that what's happened, right, is uh, we've all kind of laughed a little bit about the victor of the IT manager over the tel telecom manager in most companies. Voice telephony is just another application on the network, and it's high time that our uh, emergency services infrastructure starts seeing things in those that, that sort of light as well. Okay, but I have to say something about that. Yeah, so, however, while the IT manager may have conquered, so to speak, the difference between the sessions that we're setting up and what they look like to me as the IT manager, very, very different what the bulk data or the, the interactive data look like. This is very different. We actually do a project in my uh, Datacom classes where we just do a compare. So if you had to differentiate at layer four, not at layer five because everything is, is encrypted, but if you wanted to go and look at the signature of real-time communications applications and the signature of my email or the signature of all the other things I do, very, very different. And so as an IT manager, if you don't understand the sessions or the calls or the I got to talk to you stuff, because ain't nobody going to call it a session except us. I mean, sessions are what you have with your shrink, right? I mean. <laughs> That's probably something we all could benefit from. There you go. By yeah. the end of this, we will. But the, the, point, the point is, you know, 
it's very different what that IT yep. manager, and that yep. IT manager should right. understand the session. Right, yeah, and there's certainly no implication that there isn't difference in, in terms of the different types of communication, but the underlying technologies that support real-time communications over the internet or internet type technologies, and that what supports bulk or batch type transactions, the transition base, it's still TCP IP, I mean, okay, some of it's UDP, some of it, whatever, there's different protocols, but it certainly is not tip and ring and uh, negative, for 20, it, all of that is going away, and people need to be able to understand that the way that that's been done, and I know we've had those discussions, some people think that it's gonna hang on till the bitter end, it probably will, but someday, somewhere, some of that stuff's gonna end up getting flushed out of the system. Almost done, there's just about three or four pictures here and then I'll finish up, I might only be about five or 10 minutes late, so that's not too bad. Um, we talk about cloud, right? It's important, right, to realize that there's different types of cloud, there's different types of uh, XAAS out there, we talked about it, whether it's platform, whether it's infrastructure, these are the types of technology terms people are gonna have to get familiar with in the new world. Admiral Simpson mentioned earlier the work of Workgroup 1 at uh, um, TFOPA. I thought it was beneficial to at least let everyone see when he talked about uh, emergency communication cybersecurity centers. This is actually something real. It's in the Workgroup 1 report. It's in the, the, the final report. If you want to look at at least one concept about how to do this cybersecurity defense in depth at a regional level, it's there. People can take a look at it. Um, there's been a lot of good thought that's gone into it. This will just get to be more and more important as things go forward. But I, again, threw this in here as a little bit of a tickler to encourage people to go look at the report. We talked about SDN, as I said before, just uh, here, this is not encouraging or endorsing any particular vendor's approach. This is just trying to indicate to people that when we talk about this type of technology, we're really talking about a final separation between a very um, hardware intensive network deployment model Anybody that's ever had to configure Cisco routers or set up transport networks realizes most of what's done in networking today is still done by command line. It's a fairly arcane subject that allows people to, at least until recently, to command some fairly decent salaries. And it's not very efficient when you have to mix and match and morph network architectures to match rapidly changing data center architectures and applications that are in place in those data centers. Um, SDN and NFV, as we talked about earlier in the, in the day, at least gives us the potential to have more software control to really create something. I know it sounds silly because most network services are, are offered by service providers, but there's been the cutesy moniker of network as a service that's been thrown around. It really does allow for rapid software-based control of underlying network elements. And it also does allow, as we've talked about before, and some PCAPs have already taken advantage of the technology to buy cheaper transport and let things like resiliency and quality of service be handled by some of these newer technologies. So it's just something for people to be aware of if you haven't thought about it before. IoT, we beat this one totally to death. I only put this one in here. Uh, I could never do any more justice than to what uh, Henning already talked about earlier today. But sometimes people have a particular notion of what IoT is. This comes from one of the, um, Be Beecham Research is a, a consultancy overseas that does international work in IoT. Um, I put it here just to make sure that anybody who thinks that IoT is simple or that there's an easy approach to it or the categorization of the technology is relatively straightforward um, is mistaken. It's a complicated subject that'll take a lot of uh, cycles and a lot of energy in the technology business for the next couple of years. Um, I think Henning found the, the key problem is as this becomes ubiquitous without adequate security, I know that somebody, I don't know who I was talking to once and it was very tongue in cheek, especially if we're recording this, but if I ever were to start my own company in the next uh, 18 to 36 months, I think an area that I would wanna try to do something about and collect uh, sufficient um, technology resource around me is this whole issue of IoT security. As devices come to dominate and machine to machine discussion and uh, talking and communication on the network abounds, as he pointed out so eloquently this morning, without adequate security for that, all it is is just a chance for the bad actors out there to lick their chops and to look for new ways mm -hmm. to compromise the system. So I think with that, Yes, so the rest of this presentation, which you can look at online, I'm not gonna claim any originality for. It comes from the work group two uh, final report presentation that was given in January um, in front of the FCC's uh, Task Force on Optimal PSAP Architecture. Since it is in the public domain, I had no qualms about including it in here. I think that you guys should take a look at the slides if you get a chance because it talks about the interplay as we only got to just touch on on the panel between governance and technology. The technology is no value unless the governance models 
um, up, are, are changed and morph and evolve with it. And the new governance, new structures, even new funding without the right technology investments at the right time to take advantage of things that are changing in our technology landscape as quickly as they can um, will also re reveal or, or result in diminished results. We need to have both working in concert and that stovepipe approach that we've taken to technology governance funding operations in 911, hopefully one of the things that'll be uh, put to rest is that and that this synergistic holistic approach to uh, our industry which has come to nominate other sectors and who've made that successful transition that hopefully we will be able to do that too. Take advantage of some of the technologies that you heard about today and uh, hopefully when we gather a year hence, uh, we'll have a lot of progress to talk about in uh, um, addressing some of these issues and hopefully we'll have another panel discussion um, that was as lively as the one that we had today. Those are really the only prepared remarks that I had for today. I actually am only seven minutes over. I'm happy to take questions, but I honestly think folks probably are ready to call it a day. Uh, I'm quite thankful um, to Mark and to Carol for asking me to be the cleanup hitter today. Um, hopefully the con conference was valuable to everyone, that you uh, heard something interesting, new, different, uh, above all that the people had an aha moment of, uh, I never heard that before, or geez, I never thought that, or I really disagree with that, right? If we did that, then we really were successful, because if all we do is agree with each other, um, it, nobody moves forward, but if we... No, there's still it tomorrow. Yes, yes, I, I do, but at least for what I was doing today, I wanted to make sure that uh, uh, people understood that this was more of a cleanup. Yeah, you've got, I think, like two more sessions. Uh, yeah, we have a morning yeah, session right. and we have a, a wrap-up uh, keynote as well. So we are going tomorrow and we're going to have a uh, an hour-long panel yep. on our uh, indoor location platform. Right, yeah, and I know, tomorrow, Reinhardt, so you have a presentation tomorrow, right? Yeah. Or. I, th I thought I saw your name on the, yeah. maybe it's the panel. No, I just, yeah. I didn't want you to think you were totally right. Right, 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 yeah, yeah, thank you for that. No, I knew that. I just meant for today. Okay. I meant for today, okay. yeah, yeah, but I would let you talk about whatever you had well, coming just, tomorrow, yeah. so. No, no, that's fine. I'm gonna thank you so much. Yeah. So, I'm done. Thanks, folks. Thank you very much.